So tonight, uh, as in past nights, we have two words before us, two words that would be quite extreme, quite different, and yet hopefully tonight we're able to show you how the gospel brings them together. Those two words that we're going to take up tonight are the words hatred and love. Hatred and love. You'd say that those are extreme words. Uh, I can think of even currently and in our uh, in our in our current society, it's not unlikely for me to, to go out and drive down the street and to see signs uh, that that would say that there's no need for hate in this life, no need for hate in this community, and and people are promoting that, and anybody would promote that 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 we should always gravitate towards love and and disdain hatred. And that is true when it comes to our interactions with one another. But we're going to see from the Bible tonight that there are certain types of hatred that are, are certainly validated because the Lord Jesus had them. We're going to speak about him tonight and hopefully be able to do that around this word hatred. And Matt will speak on love. He definitely has maybe the easier half of the meeting tonight when it comes to these words. But let's read a verse together. It's found in the Gospel of John, John chapter 15. We're going to read John 15 and verse 25. John 15 and verse 25. Now remember, when you read John's gospel, this is the gospel that deals with love over and over and over and over again. It, it mentions love more in this book than any of the other gospels combined. And so it really is a book that just has so much emphasis on love. So when we read the word hate, we really got to take note. Why would John, why does the gospel writer even use the word it must be significant because he seems to use love so many times and hate so few times. We're going to read one of those instances tonight in John 15 and verse 25. Here's what the verse says, John 15 and verse 25. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. It says this, but this cometh to pass that the word might be filled. I'm sorry, this is John speaking about the Lord Jesus. But this comes to pass that the word might be fulfilled, that it is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. They hated me without a cause. What John is saying here is that when people hated the Lord Jesus without a cause, they were fulfilling a prediction, a prediction that had been made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before he was ever born. It comes from the book of Psalms. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. But it was a prediction. And he says here that they fulfilled this prediction. It was written down in the Bible long before Christ ever came into the world. But they were true to what the Bible said, maybe not even knowing it. And they hated him without a cause. Those are very strong words and very sad words. But words that I'd like to speak on tonight, along with some other uh, Bible scriptures. And we will read that too. And that's in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 1 and verse 9. We're going to read just a second verse tonight. That also has the word hate in it. Hebrews 1 and verse 9 says this. Hebrews 1 and verse 9 says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above your fellows. So we read in this verse about the Lord Jesus, that he loved righteousness and hated iniquity. The, uh, the, the title for my short message tonight is Hated Without and Hated Within. I just want to speak on those two things. He hated, it was hated without, and he hated within. We're going to speak about those two phrases there tonight through this gospel message. When it says about the Lord Jesus that they hated him without a cause, it was a prediction. We said that from Psalm 69, you can go back and read that. And when you read through the Psalms, you realize how many of the predictions that were made about the Lord Jesus that were so sad. They predicted that they would nail his hands to the cross and his feet. They predicted that he would be betrayed. They predicted that men would spit upon him. They predicted all these things about him, that he would be left without anybody to take comfort upon him. And all these things that he would be falsely accused and over and over again, all these predictions that were so sad that the Lord Jesus fulfilled when he came here. A lot of times in life, we uh, think, oh, if only someone could tell me the future, how great it would be to know the future. But not if it was bad. 
if it was bad, you would avoid the future if you knew it was going to be bad. But the Lord Jesus knew these things were going to happen. And yet he didn't avoid coming to this place, earth. He didn't avoid coming here. In fact, he came here with gladness, knowing that men would crucify him, that they would hate him without a reason, that they would mock him, that they would betray him. You say, that's tremendous love. And yet here we read one of these predictions, hated without a cause. There are certain statements in the Bible that are made, and there are statements that could be said of no one else. And so we say they claim that the Lord Jesus Christ was more than just a mere man. He was more than just a man. He had to be God. And I take it that this is one of those statements. If you can tell me another individual on earth who has never given anybody ever, has never given a reason for men to dislike him or her, that would be an exceptional individual. I've never met one. I've never known one. From the sweetest grandmother to the worst bully at school, every individual has given at least once, if not more in their life, reason to be disliked by someone else. And here it's said about Jesus Christ. He was hated without a cause. There was no reason to hate him. Not a single one. And yet men did. And if you were to say, why? Why hate him? They didn't have a reason. They just hated him. They could have hated him because he exposed what was in their hearts. And the Bible tells us that. And so that's significant when we come to this statement. But what I love so much is that he was hated without a cause. And you know what he did in response? He loved without a cause. Without cause. If you were to say to me, Dave, why does Jesus Christ love you? There's no reason in me. Not a single reason in me. In my whole life up to this point, and my whole life from this point on will never produce one reason for Christ to love me. He loves me without a reason. It's the same way we hated him. What a contrast. That the way he was hated is the way he loves. That's a statement that is so significant in the Bible. Because I know that there are men hate the fact that their sin has been exposed. And so they hated the Lord Jesus. They hated his father. In fact, the Bible, this book that we read, John, you look around at the world we live in. The Lord Jesus said four or five times, the world hates me. The world hates my father. The world will hate you if you are like me. And we live in a world that we can say it hates Jesus Christ without a cause. They'll produce causes. You say they aren't reasons. They're just pride. They're just sin being exposed. But thank God that he loved us without a cause. In fact, we were reading in the book of Titus last night in chapter 3. And how significant that if you go read Titus 3, it tells us there about men, what's inside each one of us. And it says this, that hate was inside them, and they were hateful, and they hated one another. That's how it says. That's, that's the last statement that Titus is told there by the Apostle Paul. And to think, the next verse tells me this that the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared. How tremendous that in response to hatred, his love appeared here on earth in a person of Jesus Christ. And so hated, when you think about Jesus Christ, remember this prediction that John writes down in the 15th chapter. They hated him without a cause, without a reason. You say, that's so sad, but I'm so glad that the same individual, the same people that hated him without a cause, I'll never have to give him a reason to love me. He loves me. And he loved me enough to die for me, to die for my sins. You see, because he was hated without a cause. But we read in our second verse there in Hebrews 1 and 9, that he hated something that is within each one of us. The Bible says there he loved righteousness and he hated iniquity. He hated iniquity. And, and all the instances that we can say, don't use the word hate. You know, there are times in life where the word hate is completely appropriate. Every time we see things that just drag society down, when we, say, when we see the worst in mankind, we say, that is something to hate. That is something to hate. When we see people take advantage of others, when we, when we see individuals just disdain for others, 
we say, oh, what, what a thing to hate, the, the cruelty and the sin within us. And Jesus Christ was just the same. He loved righteousness, but he hated iniquity. So significant because a lot of people tell me, they go, oh, love and hate, they're opposites. But it's not true. The, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is just, I don't care. I don't care is the opposite of love. And so it tells me something significant about Jesus Christ, that he cared enough to come to this world to die for what he hated. He died for sins. He died for the one thing he hated. It was sin. And the Bible tells us, and Matt mentioned it the other night in 2 Corinthians 5, that God made him sin. God made his son what he hated in order that he might make me the righteousness of God. What a tremendous truth that what Christ loved, I can be made into. And what he hated what was within me. He hated, he hated this. I think of these two things of hatred and love. And I think about what the Lord Jesus said. And he said it there in Matthew 5. We've read the Sermon on the Mount. One of the greatest messages ever given by a preacher was given by the Lord Jesus as he began his ministry. And he said this. He said, you know, everybody thinks it's okay to love your neighbor, and hate your enemy. But I say to you, no, you've got to love your enemy. Love your enemy the same way you love your family, the same way you love your neighbor. Love your enemy just like that. You look at me and you say, that is impossible. Impossible. It would be impossible if it were not for the love of Jesus Christ. You know, when I think that if the standard were just loving my neighbor, I may be able to attain to it in life. But when God raises the standard of not just hating those who have, who have been my enemies, but loving them, he brings the standard to a point I can't achieve. And he does that so that I could say, I can't reach that standard, but one man did. The man who hated iniquity died for his enemies. He loved his enemies and he died for their sins. And here, how true it is that using the word hatred, we can see such tremendous truths about Jesus Christ that when the world looked at him, they hated him and they had no cause. There was nothing in that man that could be hated. He was holy, harmless. He was separate from sins. He was undefiled. Nothing in him could be hated. And men said they hated him. The Bible tells they hated him because he came and he told people that they had sins within him. What a wonderful truth to ever know that. Because if I didn't know that, I wouldn't know that I qualified for God's salvation. Because Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Not only that he was hated without, but that he hated within. He hated what was within each one of us. The sin within us. He hated that, the iniquity that has torn this world apart. The reason that we hate people because they have different political beliefs, the reason that we hate people because they come from a different country, all that hatred, that all comes from our sin. Every single point of it comes from our sin. Think, think how the tiniest things that, that separate us, the tiniest things that cause us to take up, uh, our, 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 take up our, our our weapons and to go to war, just the smallest things. It could be dirt that we fight over. And hatred has run rampant in this world, but never was it seen greater than at Calvary. Never was there more hatred than on a Friday afternoon in the year 8033, and never was there more love than in that same day. And those six hours, there was never more hatred when men nailed the creator to a cross, and never was there more love than the one who hated sins became sin, and he died. For those that he loved. As you continue to listen to Matt speak about love, recognize this that the Lord Jesus Christ, to appreciate his love, you have to appreciate those he loved, those of us that hated him without a cause. And to appreciate how much he loved us, you have to appreciate that he was willing to die for the one thing he hated sins, iniquities, transgressions. He was willing to die for those. So the next time you think of hatred, think of hatred within each one of us and think of hatred without. He was hated without a cause, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Matt as he tells us about the love of God that tells us something so sweet that we could have this love shown to us and know it's true because Christ died for our sins.
Thanks, Dave. We're going to read uh, a verse in 1 John in chapter 4. And the verse says this, 1 John chapter 4, and I'll start at verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Now, the verse that's on my heart tonight is verse 10, and it says these words, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The only other reading I have is in the book of Luke chapter 4. Many have asked the question, well, why did Christ come? Why was Jesus on the earth? And so you hear his announcement of his ministry as Jesus is speaking in verse 18 of Luke chapter 4. And he says these words as he's speaking to individuals watching him. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So we're going to speak about love. Dave mentioned it's the uh, uh, perhaps the easiest side of the message. I would I would say uh, perhaps one might think that yes, but uh, actually quite inexhaustible. So uh, if you study the love of God through Scripture, it's very difficult. We can't touch it in 15 minutes. We couldn't touch it in our lifetime, and we'll only understand it when we get to eternity. If you look at the uh, uh, New English translation of the Bible, you'd see that word love 636 times it's mentioned in Scripture. And it's sad when we think of loving people. It's a sad day when we meet uh, professing, perhaps even Christians who are filled with gossiping or backbiting or not showing love, not showing the kindness, not emulating Christ. Interesting, Dave opened with uh, he is hated without or he was hated without and hated within. Uh, the message on God's love is how he loves without. He loves the sinner and he loves within. He loves the believers. He loves the body of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 13 tells us what true love really is. The writer says love suffers long and is kind. He says love doesn't envy. He says love doesn't parade itself. It's not puffed up or it's, it's not arrogant. It doesn't behave itself rudely. It's not rude to someone else. You say you love someone and you're rude to them. That's not what love does. Love doesn't seek its own. It's not selfish. It's not provoked. It's not easily aroused in anger. It thinks no evil of someone else. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity. That's what love is. It rejoices in truth. Love bears all things. That's what the writer is saying. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. And when God's love was displayed on a cross, when his son Christ died on a cross once and forever, and he was buried and he rose again, love for the sinner never failed. Man has tried to show their love. We, they, they, they do that in many ways. <laughs> There's many gifts that people give. I was just Googling this earlier today just for kicks on, on really what people have given to show love to another person. I'll tell you, love can't be bought. But in, uh, in 2013, uh, Mike Tyson bought his then wife, Robin Gibbons, a 24 karat gold bathtub. It was a $2 million bathtub. It's not his wife anymore, but he bought it for her then to show love. Angelina Jolie purchased Brad Pitt, uh, an actual home over a 30 foot waterfall back in 2012, based on his love for the architecture by Frank Lloyd Wright. It wasn't enough. A few years later, she had to go and buy him an island. Beyonce got Jay-Z, if you're listening and you're younger, a Bombardier Challenger 85 jet for Father's Day, a token of love. In 2008, Indian business tycoon by the name of Anil Ambani bought his wife Tina a super yacht named Tyan. It was known as the Royals Royce of the Water, $84 million yacht out of a token of love. A New York banker to even... Bring this a little further. Martin Plank, back in 1979, traded his six-story mansion for a Cartier pearl necklace for his wife to show love. The Taj Mahal, known as the most famous public displays of affection of all time. 1592 to 1666, the ruler Shah Jahan spent an equivalent of $830 million as a gift to his wife. 22 years in the making. 20,000 artisans to make this. One might say, wow, amazing love. Well, interesting that it's proven that most men would give gifts to show love, usually when the love was first shown to them, and with love expected to be reciprocated. They're showing love to someone who has shown love to them, and they're expecting something 
in return. It's different when we look at God's love. God loves because he alone knows. He alone rejoices in the truth about himself and what he's doing in human beings and what he's doing for human beings. He doesn't love us because he chose to do so or because he feels obligated or to constantly manufacture an emotion similar to compassion or something to show love. He loves us because that's the truth, listen carefully, of who God is, our joyful eternal truth. It's a truth that believers relish in. God is love. And he demonstrated love to humanity when his son Christ went to a cross. He bled for sinners. He suffered punishment for sinners and judgment, and he died on an old rugged tree. And him that comes to me, Jesus says, I will never cast out. Come to God today, just in your broken sins. It's not a wonder why 1 Corinthians 13 ends with verse 13, and it says this, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three, the writer says, but the greatest of these is love. Why is it so great? Because the greatest display of love, Brother Dave already mentioned it early, was on a place called Calvary where the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of man, died for his creation and all their sins. He paid for their sins in full. He endured the judgment of God in full. And the Godhead in heaven itself was satisfied with the work of Christ. Tremendous word when we think of God's love to man. It's different than the way you and I think of it. Where was it explicitly shown? You think of even Jesus as he met a leper. It says Jesus is moved with compassion. The leper, a link to our sin. He is covered from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He has to cry out outside a city, unclean, unclean. And you and I before God are unclean. We're broken in our sins. But God had Christ moved with compassion. He reaches forth and he touches the leper and he heals him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. God would love to heal you of your problem of sin today. He'd love to take the burden of your sin. He'd love to show you that you could be made just by the one who the just one, Christ, who died for us, the unjust, and make us right in the eyes of God, justified, just as if we've never sinned. God looks down upon a sinner who has come to trust Christ, and he sees the blood of Christ that covers him and removes the guilt and the payment and the penalty of his sin as far as the east is from the west. Calvary, amazing love. The writer wrote those words, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? When God sent his son knowing how wicked man's sin was, he sent him anyway. When God sent his son knowing that men would reject his son, they would hate his son, he sent him anyway. When God knew that men would verbally abuse his son, when they would mentally abuse his son, when they would physically abuse his son, God sent him anyway. When God knew that men would spit on him and cause him more pain than any man has ever gone through, God sent him anyway. In the fullness of time, God's word says, God sent forth his son. To be the savior of the world. You know, I've seen my oldest son, as a father, I have four. I've seen my oldest son get bullied in ninth grade. I can't tell you what goes through the heart of a father as you look on the outside. You'd love to take his place. You'd love for that situation never to happen. And you watch. Just yesterday, our youngest boy at seven got hurt. He was riding on a swing. I was at the park. And um, he came to me. His knees were bleeding, but his arm was bleeding even more on his on his elbow. His face was covered with sweat and dirt. It's very, or in Phoenix, it's very hot. And big green watery eyes begging, as it were, as he looked at me holding his arm, just for me to take the pain away. And I would have, but I couldn't. I would have loved to take his place and to remove it and have me get hurt and him not get hurt, but I can't. Walking home from that same situation, he chose not to ride bike. He was frustrated. I heard him talking. I said, Hudson, who are you talking to? And he says, I'm talking to God. I said, what are you talking about God for? What are you talking to God about? Hudson said, I'm I'm telling God that when I die, I want to be in heaven. He's only seven. You know what had happened? He he had just got shaken. He had just got scared in his little life. And he's just wondering at the age of seven, like, when I die, I just want to be in heaven. Is that you today? What about you? Do you ever just talk to God? No, no fancy vernacular, no, diff, no fancy words and some spin to impress God. You just ask God, what does it take to be in heaven? What does it take for a sinner like me to ever enter heaven? How could you show me through the word of God what you've done for sin? And God in his word would show you the person of Christ. Do you ever want to just be in heaven when you die? I would tell you this, turn to Calvary. The writer penned those words, Calvary, O oh Calvary, mercy's vast, unfathomed sea, love, eternal love to me, Savior, We adore thee. One of my favorite hymns to sing, Savior, 
we adore thee. Why? Because there was love there. It was eternal love to me. And it was displayed for the human being. When they hated him without a cause, he loved them. And he loved them unto death. Arsene Boca wrote these words. God's love for the biggest sinner is greater than the love of the holiest man for God. Do you follow that? God's love for the biggest sinner on this call today is greater than the love of the holiest man for God. All the love in the world doesn't compare for a second to God's love for humanity. One has stated this, anyone can love a rose, but it takes a great deal to love a leaf. You follow? Anyone can love a rose. It's so pretty. But it takes a great deal to love a leaf, especially a dead leaf. Ordinary to love the beautiful, but it's beautiful when one loves the ordinary. And when Jesus is speaking in Luke chapter 4, he has come to seek those that were unattractive. Notice the words he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has, he says, anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the leaves as it were. Anyone can love a rose, but it takes a great deal of love to love a leaf. Unattractive, those that are poor, those that are destitute of the comforts of this life. Those that might be even perhaps more readily disposed to seek treasures in heaven. They have nothing on this life. Sensible for sins. They're poor in spirit. Perhaps they're in prison to phobias in this life. Perhaps they're in prison to identifying with past addictions, past failures, past hurts, all these different things. God comes in. He says, I have come to preach the gospel to the poor, the poor in spirit. He says he, I, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Again, unattractive. There's not a person on the call that wants to hang around with brokenhearted people all the time. They zap energy, as it were. These are people that are deeply afflicted, whose hearts are broken, maybe some by, by some external calamity, maybe by a sense of their own sinfulness. But they're looking at their past and they're saying, there's no way God could heal me and their hearts are broken. That's why Christ came. He came to proclaim liberty to the captives. That term there would think of captivity in Babylon, miserable, their bondage. And God says, I have come, Christ says, for the ones that are in despair, for the ones that are discouraged, for the ones that are depressed, for the ones that are filled with anxiety, filled with worry, filled with fear, filled with insecurity. God never intended you to live that way. Jesus came and he came to set man free. Recovery of sight to the blind. This is literally fulfilled in scripture. You know that Jesus would heal those that were blind and give them sight. But also spiritually, when a sinner is blind, he gets sight. That physical and spiritual blindness, Christ came to heal. Living far less than what God ever intended us to live. Because we can't see, we're blinded by the God of this world. Christ says he came to go to a cross only to give sight to those that are blind and to set at liberty them that are oppressed. Those leaves, those unattractive people, God came to set at liberty them that are oppressed. I came not to call the righteous, he said. I came to call sinners to repentance. Those that are bruised, brokenhearted, captives, those that are blind, those that are oppressed. Christ says, I came to release them from all their bondage. And he did that on an old cross. Edward C. Quine wrote those words. Listen very carefully as you consider Calvary and God's love for you. Deep were thy sorrows, Lord, when heaven frowned. Gethsemane, blood like thy sweat, Lord, falling to the ground so heavily. Dark was the night, but heaven was darker still. Oh, Christ, my God, is this the Father's will? The writer continues, he writes, thorns wreath thy brow when hanging on the tree, man's cruelty. He asks the question, why lavish love like this, O Lord, on me? The answer comes back from heaven, thou lovest me. Would that my soul could understand its length, its breadth, depth, height, and everlasting strength. We'll never understand the love of God for sinners. Thy precious blood was freely shed for me. He continues writing on Calvary. Christ died for you on Calvary to save me from a lost eternity. Glory to thee, nor death, nor hell, nor things below above can sever me from thy eternal love. Once someone is saved, once someone has come to trust Christ, they're eternally brought into the family of God. They are engraved in the palms of his hands. The writer continues as he ends that beautiful hymn. Like shoreless seas, thy love can know no bound. Thou lovest me. Deep, vast, immense, unfathomed, Lord, profound. Lord, I love thee. And when above my crown is at thy feet, I'll praise thee still for Calvary's mercy seat. Christ came. He lived a sole purpose to go to a cross. Interesting, the individuals that live today, our purpose as we grow older is to get a career, to, to, to perhaps be wealthy, 
to have a family, to have blessings, to build, to climb the ladder. Christ came to go to a cross, to pay for sins once and forever. One who had never been hit in eternity past was hit on a cross. One who had never been pierced in eternity past was pierced on this earth just for you. One who had never been wounded in eternity past. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He was wounded. He was wounded on a cross just for you. And there was no one there ever to help. As he, as it were, looked to his father, there was darkness and silence. And it was all for you. You say those words, Matt. What did you say at the beginning of the meeting? First John chapter 4. Listen to these words. In this, the love of God was manifested. The love of God was shown toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that man loved God. That's what Dave spoke about. They hated him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son, Christ, to be the propitiation for our sins, to be the satisfaction for our sins, the payment for our sins. George Whitfield loved the law so much. He was once heard saying these words. My heart, he said, is full of love for you. I would speak, he said, till I could speak no more. So I could but bring you to Christ. He would have almost died for those that were lost. The people that would give their life to see someone saved. They love to preach to people that are lost. They love to see souls won for the kingdom of God. But you know what? And all that love and everything they've sacrificed, it still doesn't compare to God's love. What's the expression of God's love? Listen to these words and I close. John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And you could have everlasting life tonight. You can know Christ as your Lord. You can know Christ as your Savior. You can know heaven as your home. Why? Because Christ came into the world to save sinners.